Right, hello and welcome to the third and final webinar in a series launching ARC, which is the Age Reform Coalition. Now, today's webinar is uh, introducing Better in Care Home Systems, which are, who are part of the Age Reform Coalition. Uh, and today's uh, webinar is focused on uh, transparency at the top, um, ensuring care home owners are incentivized to offer the best possible care to residents. Now, the, the session will be split into uh, a number of sections. Uh, first of all, we'll be uh, undertaking a uh, presentation from Patrick Taylor, who is the founder of Bettering Care Home Systems, uh, and uh, later we'll be having a Q&A. If you have joined us and you're interested in posting a question, then please use the Q&A function uh, to post that question. Now, uh, my name is Richard Robinson, and I'm Chief Exec of Hourglass, which is the UK's only charity focused on tackling the abuse and neglect of older people. And we are part of the Age Reform Coalition in collaboration with three peer charities or organisations. Uh, those are Nightingale's Army, Say So, and Bettering the Care Home Systems. Uh, and we've come together to scrutinise and lobby for changes in age-related legislation, as well as improving professional standards and employee rights in care settings. And ARC is also looking to create or lobby to create an all party parliamentary group on safer ageing and professional standards. We're really keen on building a coalition of like minded uh, politicians and peers. So it's a coalition of like minded uh, organisations with a common purpose. Now today's uh, roundtable uh, webinar is focused on transparency at the top. Uh, and I will ask each of the panelists today to introduce themselves. And what we'll do is we'll finish with Patrick Taylor, who will have a short presentation for us. So if we start with Christine Corlett uh, Walker. Hi, thanks Richard. Um, yep, my, uh, my name is Christine Collett Walker. I'm a um, researcher at the Centre for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity. Um, and my research for the last few years has been uh, looking at the financialization of the social care sector and the impacts that that has on working conditions and quality of care in care homes. Thanks, Christine. Um, Andy Jones. Uh, yeah, good morning. I, I'm uh, Andy Jones. I'm a Chartered Accountant by background. Um, and previously worked as a board director in um, several financial services companies in the city, probably most notably uh, European Finance Director at Fidelity. Thanks, Andy. And Sean Keep? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, Sean Keep. Um, I've got 34 years uh, background working in the Met Police uh, as a detective, dealing with all sorts of uh, serious and major crime. Um, in the last few years, and certainly since 2015, uh, I've had sort of a, a viewpoint into the care sector, reviewing a number of serious care failures, etc. Um, and also since 2017, I've, I've formed a, a, a service called Say So, uh, which is effectively a uh, independent uh, reporting service for care staff. And that has brought me in touch with uh, staff across the country, really, who are working in care homes. So I've, I've got an insight from a couple of levels, really, into the care sector. Thanks, Sean. So moving on to Patrick Taylor. OK, so I, I think my introduction is part of this presentation. So rather than repeating myself, I'm going to go straight into the presentation, if that's all right, Richard. Can you all see that? Absolutely. Great. So um, an introduction, uh, better in the care system, a bit of a mouthful, um, but it sort of says what it, uh, uh, hopefully will do what it says on the tin. Uh, but also, more importantly, we, it's also part of our ethos as well in terms of being brave, courageous, uh, having honesty in our discussions with people and sincerity. Those things that we believe are, are quite important in terms of what, what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to bash particular people. Uh, we're just trying to see where weaknesses in the system are and uh, hopefully lobby for uh, what we see as, um, uh, as change, hopefully as, as part of a, a wider um, coalition of people. So our story, which to a certain extent is more my story to start with, um, because I think it's important to understand, you know, um, why more and more people like me are getting off their backsides and actually um, lobbying for change. So um, actually, um, this, this is slightly self-indulgent, but I think it's pertinent, especially in terms of um, the, the story of BCHS. So on the 20th of, of October 2018, sadly, um, my dad had, had just passed. Um, but Jonathan Agnew read out and tested my special. Some of you might remember it. 
Um, but the, but I think the most important thing is he, this is um, um, uh, an extract uh, of of what um, old age can uh, can actually be like. Hopefully, this multimedia extravaganza is going to work perfectly well. Let's see. <clears throat> But I'm just going to read out a remarkable email from Patrick Taylor, who's, uh, who's written an email saying, My dad, John Taylor, had, unlike the current England batting lineup, dug in and battled doggedly to reach 83. He built gradually through to his 50s as a true gentleman, a pharmacist, sportsman, father of two boys, until unexpected cloud cover descended, just as he was looking to break free from the shackles and play with the freedom that retirement would bring. On an ever-increasingly sticky wicket, he faced up and defended against a beamer in the form of leukaemia, the yorker of muscular dystrophy, the googly of Parkinson's, the reverse swing of diabetes, and latterly was struck down by the vicious bouncer of dementia. But like fellow Yorkshireman Brian Close, he never winced, complained or succumbed to the temptation of amateur dramatics. He just accepted the cards he'd been dealt and squeezed every last drop out of life that he could on a single-by-single -single basis with his amazing care team acting as runners. On 83, Dad finally faced the inevitable, unplayable delivery and left the field of play. OK, so not, not quite as seamless as I wanted to be, but hopefully that, that worked. Um, so since that time, my mum, Julia, who's blind, um, 81 years old, old um has had an awful time in the care home system um so between 20 and 21 during covid she um was shunted between eight different care homes and actually a mental hospital because um as it said there she caught covid twice was wrongly sectioned wrongly evicted and suffered a broken wrist gashed arm through care home neglect my experience was that this is a sector that's in trouble now that's a very personal experience um, but it was uh, astounding. Um, so this motivated me to get together with a group of friends, which um, uh, Andy is, is one. Um, and I think it's also important to note that clearly COVID-19 has decimated this section of society much more than any other. And in fact, if you took the 40,000 deaths and transferred that into the general population, it'd be equivalent to 7 million people dying of COVID uh, in, the, in the general po uh, population. Um, and I think we believe that that's a, that's a symptom of not just that the government completely messed it up. Um, I, I almost used an inappropriate word there. Um, it, it's more a, a, a symptom of underinvestment in frontline care as well, um, in terms of just not being able to uh, not being able to cope. That's a picture of mum and me. So just in terms of our people, so uh, my lovely wife. I'm not going to go through the full. Um, the full barrage but uh, Susie got a black belt before me so she's quite dangerous uh, and I'm slightly afraid of her which is uh, probably a very healthy thing uh, but her quote in terms of motivation was the unregulated care home system feels more like the wild west we both went on quite a journey in terms of research and I believe it's about time we start putting elders rights above minority groups and animals we do seem to have a, a strange problem in this country of writing old people off um, uh, and therefore, in, in the hierarchy of, of needs for change, elders seem to come quite a long way down the uh, down the list. Uh, Mark McCone is a judge and barrister, and his his motivation is seen the impact which poor care has had on other families, actually through cases that he's been involved in. Uh, and I'm keen to be part of a team who can influence change, particularly as to how evidence of poor care uh, is obtained, and we'll, we'll come on to that um, a little bit later. Paul, um, very much... Um, uh, an entrepreneur, um, uh, retired at 40, uh, but does a lot of work for Alzheimer's support um, and is a fitness uh, instructor, and I believe has been into care homes as well, uh, doing that uh, sort of armchair uh, exercises. His quote, high quality care should be the absolute minimum that everyone should receive as they enter the most challenging period of their life. It seems that the ethos of quality care seems to have been lost, particularly for a section of uh, the care home industry. Uh, obviously, Mr. Jones, who's given his uh, his, his basic um, um, intro, but um, his quote is his involvement in BCHS is driven by his interest in people and deep conviction that society has a duty to protect and support those less fortunate uh, than ourselves. Um, we've been at this for about 18 months now, um, and what we've put together is that 
the financialization of care homes um, is our number one priority. So um, believe it or not, Christine, it was it was pre Panorama or anything like that. You know, Andy very much said we really need to try and get to the core reason of why things don't seem to be working. Uh, and very much that you know his expertise, Paul's expertise, and to a certain extent Mark's expertise is is in that particular area. So yeah, this you reckon you'll recognise all of this in terms of a care transparency act or legis or similar legislation, which basically keeps the big boys honest. Uh, in effect, that's that's the to me that's the that's the ethos of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, the prevention of complex offshore ownership structures designed to avoid UK tax by large providers. I think six of the large providers have that set up. Um, the setting of maximum leverage and minimum equity, i.e. enough money in the bank uh, to ensure the financial viability of camps, much like banks were forced to have to be bailed out of the 2009 financial crash. Uh, hopefully we're not coming going towards a crash of the care homes, but certainly there's no money being made in that sector at the moment, uh, especially after, after post-COVID. Uh, and it feels to me like people are hanging on until this injection of money comes from the government uh, in sort of two and a half years' time. Uh, the introduction of robust regulatory oversight of care home providers, but with an emphasis on quality of care. Um, uh, this, the the uh, CQC um, gets a lot of flack, but to me, it's just not fit for purpose in terms of size and resources, but most importantly, the power that they have or don't have. Uh, encouragement of alternative to provide investor care homes. So something around solutions. You know, if 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 you if you're going to try and limit large big business within this sector, then what are you going to try and look to do um, uh, in, in its place? Um, our other objectives. I'll go through these very quickly. So that's not really what it's about today. So police and CPS to try and get them on board uh, in, in terms of uh, taking elder abuse more seriously. Uh, digital evidence, which I noticed uh, that Mark very much, um, our barrister sort of said, he said he thinks that the law is perfectly adequate, uh, but it's just not used enough because gathering evidence uh, is often extremely difficult. It becomes uh, the elder's word against the whole system. Um, so it's, uh, it's pretty much stacked against elders in terms of successfully bringing court cases. Uh, and then finally, um, reviewing, actually getting the British public to take note. And you know, I tend to go on holiday and use TripAdvisor for everywhere that I go. Um, so, you know, people are willing to do it over a good meal and, and take time to do a review. How can we encourage families, friends, residents to give more honest views and a more vol greater volume to um, uh, get an idea of what the best care homes are? Very briefly, and this is final slide, our role within ARC, um, it, it was very much driven by myself, I guess being a fresh pair of eyes and doing a lot of research, it seemed like there was a lot of very good organisations out there duplicating the same work. And that if you could get a group of like-minded um, organisations together, you could split that work more efficiently, provide hopefully a total solution um, to this area or, or some answers at least um, uh, and, and have some form of critical mass because this area is dominated by Age UK. Um, they, they do a, a very good job in certain areas um, but I, I don't think it's particularly healthy just for the government to be li to listening to um, one particular organisation just because they're um, the, the biggest. Um, so yes, for us, um, with the recent announcement of greater funding for social care, we believe that the government should be listening for solutions uh, and looking at radical reform of the system as well as just throwing the money money at the problem. We believe that there's there's maybe a little bonus um, uh, of money that's available um, due to um, a, a pretty unsustainable um, situation uh, in the care home system. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much, Patrick. That's really useful, really, really useful. It gives us some context there. Um, okay, so we will start um, the, the, the round table. A um, few things just to cover to start off with. Um, if uh, people on the, the panelists have any points to raise, please use the, the, the hand feature. Um, try not to interrupt if possible and try to own your comments as well. Um, we are uh, of course, um, in these days, we need to be very careful legally about what we say about opinions that we have that uh, could be misconstrued. Um, so in terms of the first question, um, what is the biggest priority with respect to the care home sister, uh, system? 
which the government should use the national insurance levy. Um, I think it's a pretty pertinent question with everything going on. Should we start with Christine? What's your take on that? Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Richard. So, uh, and also Patrick for a really uh, helpful uh, introduction to um, ARC and BCHS. Uh, I think your analysis of the, the problem and, and kind of the sorts of levers we need to use to, to get to some solutions is really spot on. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of what we can use the levy for, well, I mean, for me, I think one of the biggest uh, issues in terms of, um, you know, obviously we could, we will probably get onto what we think it shouldn't be used for, which is kind of all of that leakage out of the, the top. Um, but I think one of the biggest issues in terms of quality of care is actually just how under-resourced um, and understaffed these, these care homes are. So I think in the primary instance, the thing that the care sector needs, and you know, from speaking to, to carers through um, uh, interviews that I've done in the last few months, it's just clear that we need more carers. Um, you know, they need to be paid not only a better hourly wage, but also overtime pay, uh, pay for breaks, you know, proper holiday entitlement. Like, I think if we properly resource the, the workforce, then um, a lot of issues with quality of care would, you know, be massively uh, relieved. So I think for me, that money needs to be pumped straight into the workforce. Patrick, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, sure. So um, it's going to be around the sort of same sort of answer. Um, so for me, um, it's about fixing the leaky buckets that, 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 that is the current care home system. So I, I would be advocating that part of this um, national insurance levy should be actually allocated now to try and structurally start to change and evolve the care home system. Clearly you don't want revolution, otherwise people go out of business, okay? Um, but um, you can change the equilibrium. So in terms of leakage um, from, um, the CHPI report, which I think Christine was involved in, there's potentially up to £400 million of avoidable leakage um, from frontline care. So that's a, a, a potentially chunky number uh, to be, for the government to be able to, to go at. So if they spent £50 million to get £400 million back, that would be a pretty good deal and, and, and money um, well spent. But there's obviously a number of things that, that need to happen. We're talking about a particular sector of the market here. And I think generally I, I describe them as um, for um, large for profits, okay, large for profit organizations. Um, they, by number, control about two and a half percent of the um, market in terms of the number of companies. So they're, 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 those companies number about two and a half percent, but they control about 25 percent of the marketplace. And they are expanding rapidly because, in essence, they are borrowing money on their properties to be able to expand, which is why the fear is that this is something that's unsustainable, because sooner or later, you have to pay the ferryman. Um, so uh, a lot of these companies, in terms of what leakage means, um, I think our general grasp of it, there's a number of factors, but the important ones are paying inflated interest rates, often through related companies, and paying inflated rents, um, um, often through related companies. A lot of these companies split themselves up between property and rental, sorry, property and operating companies. Uh, and the operating companies are often actually theoretically bankrupt. They have negative net assets, um, which also means that their responsibilities in terms of malpractice might be quite limited if they could never pay out if they were sued. So, um, yeah, I think those are the main areas in, um, that, the, that the government um, could, could focus on. Sean, if you give us your take, please. Yeah, um, from a staffing point of view, and, and I think that's where most of my interaction with, with the care industry comes from, I think it, uh, Christine was right, recruitment and retention and turnover of staff is a massive issue. And we, we, we've got to find ways of um, uh, incentivizing, I think, care providers to do more to um, attract the staff. And it, 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 if that's around creating better workplaces, uh, improving the status of, of care staff so that people understand exactly what they do, more people understand exactly what they do, um, they're not unskilled workers who just turn up to do a sort of a, a, a menial job. They, they should be treasured in the community. And, and I think there should be local, regional, even national strategies around how that should be achieved. So uh, 
that for me is 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 the essence of what a fundamental plank of what's going wrong in the care sector at the moment it's about the status of of care staff i think there should be a real proper career career pathways um for 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 care staff so that it is um uh you know it is put in the same category as a an engineer or a an airline pilot or, or whatever because airline pilots at the end of the day they are responsible for hundreds of, of lives and so are care staff you know it's the same thing they're looking after people and keeping people fit and well and healthy and, and that status doesn't seem to be there at the moment so anything that the government can do it's not just about money but it's clever use of money that's what it's around i think okay that's really useful thanks sean andy oh, yeah just <laughs> picking up on what sean just said yeah clever use of money and i think Christine's key points about um, the issue being we need to have more staff and yeah better pay staff in these care homes to improve the quality of care to me is just common sense but the, the challenge is how do you get those more staff you either pay more money and the government needs to fund that or individual um, individuals are paying privately have to pay for that um, the money's got to come from somewhere. Now, we know um, that there's pressures from two directions. There's pressure from the government to reduce costs for those people that they fund. So that pushes down the amount of money that, that, that we, the government's prepared to pay to providers for those services. But equally, you've got pressure in the form of the private uh, providers at least in terms of maximizing their profits so for the private providers you're squeezing the amount of money that's available and left to provide staff and pay for staff simple as that and it really struck me reading the um, chpi report um, that for the 26 largest providers not for profit as well as profit making providers the largest profit making providers the leakage going out in profit, in director's remuneration, in rent, interest, was almost £20 for every £100 that went in. Compared to, and I differ with the CHAPI report because, and I explain in a minute, compared to for not-for-profit, just under £5 for every £100. It's £15 more that you could be paying for staff or paying for salaries out of every 100 mm. And that is a massive difference. Now, the CHPI report um, actually puts the leakage for not-for-profit slightly higher. But the reason it does that is it includes profit before tax. And of course, they're not-for-profit. So that, that profit before tax doesn't leak out. It goes around in the circle and it gets reinvested. So that's not leakage in my mind. Um, but it's 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 a huge amount of money that's just leaking and not being used for looking after um you know our elderly and do we want to con continue doing that it just doesn't make sense to me 15 pound out of every hundred that's raised through the um the new levy is going to go to profit and rent and interest for these private profit making entities Thanks, Andy. Before we move on, um, just a quick comment that's coming on the chat here. Um, Andrew Nicholas Jones has mentioned that we should not underestimate the savings to statutory services that care homes provide, and we need to remind governments of that. Funding should be realistic and planned, as we do for NHS and social care services, which I think is a is, is a probably an interesting point there. So, the second question was around uh, red flags in the system. So what are the kinds of financial structures that might raise red flags when looking at care providers? And how do these red flags impact quality of care and working conditions in the social care sector? Uh, should we start with Andy this time? You're on mute, Andy. <laughs> start again. Red flags. Um, well, red flags such as um, offshore ownership. Why should we need offshore offshore ownership for um, you know care homes within the UK? There's only one reason why there's offshore ownership: is to make it less transparent, so that people can't see 
where the money's going and to maximize income for those people who own those, those private companies. The third thing, actually, there is a third thing as well. It also protects them in case of um, lawsuits, because if they make the structures so complex, property is separated from the operating companies, all of their money, all the investment is in the property, of course. So there's very little should you need to sue a, a care home property, care home provider um, left to, to compensate those people. So yeah, red flag, definitely for me, offshore, um, that's that's one of the key ones, I think. And very high leverage would be the second. Okay. Christine, this is something I think you've picked up on in your uh, previous work, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And actually, um, current project that we're doing at the moment as well. So <clears throat> Andy's completely right, obviously, um, that offshore ownership is a is a big um, issue because it you know signals that there is money being sort of flowing out of the care system this is obviously also public money that's flowing kind of into the care system and then um out to offshore entities through yeah as again as patrick said you know covering a lot of the same kind of uh, areas here but you know th through inflated rents and high interest payments on intra-group loans um also these very very high um uh uh, amounts of debt as well in these large companies again is a very large red flag um not only because it's a tool that is primarily used so we have these things called debt leveraged buyouts for anybody who's not familiar with them which is where a big um you know private equity firm for example will come in and buy up a care home they'll put up a small amount of capital themselves but then they will finance the rest of the purchase using um a very large uh, loan and then the care home company itself over time pays back that loan um and so the equity portion that the private equity company owns expands and so when they sell the care home company on they get a big windfall in terms of um you know they, they've made a lot more than they would have done if they'd bought the company outright and um not only are those structures put in place you know basically solely to um kind of facilitate increased returns on investment um so there's nothing really to do with improving quality of care at all but also they have a significantly higher risk of uh, bankruptcy associated with them. So um, a recent study found that um, care homes that or, or companies that have undergone a debt leverage buyout have an 18% increased risk of, of bankruptcy. So, you know, when you're applying that to a sector where we have some of the most vulnerable people in society who um, often uh, have increased risk of morbidity and mortality if you move them between care homes, you know, it's an incredibly, um, difficult and distressing thing to do particularly for older people with high levels of need um <clears throat> you know using these sorts of strategies to improve investor returns when actually it's having potentially a very negative impact on um kind of physical and emotional well-being of, of residents um is very problematic uh, but and one extra thing that i will add is also um in terms of what we know about how these financialized techniques um impact on quality of care and working conditions there's quite a good body of literature from the us that because they've got really good data on patient outcomes and um, ownership structures our data quantitative data in the uk is um lacking to say the the least we obviously have cqc reports but they're very descriptive and categorical rather than being kind of um uh, quantitative in terms of knowing you know how many patients have what kinds of conditions and how that's moving over time so what we've done in the last three months is um, a series of really in-depth interviews with um, care staff working in care homes that have just been taken over by um, uh, investment firms and this report will be launched in early April um, but you know effectively what we find is that you know these these companies are massively negatively impacting the the kind of working conditions and quality of care on the ground through squeezing you know everything that they can get out of every hour of a care worker's time you know expanding the remit of their job reducing overtime pay um you know not enough breaks and that you know as much as the staff are doing their best to protect the residents from um any impacts of associated with those kind of difficult working conditions naturally it translates into reduced quality of care because there's only so much that the workers can themselves absorb so this sort of common um response from particularly conservative mps but also you know people working in these big for-profit companies who say well as long as the quality of care is good then it doesn't matter how we're financed um actually we're putting the pieces of the puzzle together to say yes it it does 
impact on quality of care. Um, it does massively impact on, on working conditions and the staff morale and um, et cetera. So yeah, I, I think you know, lots of red flags and those things are red flags for a, a, a good reason. And we're just starting to kind of yeah, put the evidence together on that. And Sean, this, um, we talked about staff there, uh, Christine mentioned staff there, that's, that's something that's pertinent to what you do, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. And I, and I echo uh, all of what uh, Christine was saying there. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole issue of like these overbearing levels of debt and uh, what I read about in that uh, CHPI report, um, it, it, it sends a message not only to to um, I think potential consumers or service users, but to the staff as well, that, that, that the companies actually are doing everything they can to protect themselves from any financial uh, liabilities, et cetera. So what does that say to staff? Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, we're in it for ourselves. We're not in it for you or to look after people. That's the message that, uh, that the, those sorts of structures I think send out. But the problem I have is how are these structures easily spotted by by the consumer and i think we're going to talk about that later but that is in my mind something has to change i think so that people as they walk into a care home for the first time as a prospective user um they need to know a lot of this information around actually how that how their care is a care provider is structured um so yes it, 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 as i echo what uh, christine said about staff morale uh, the, the messaging that, that those sorts of structures just say to prospective clients and uh, and staff is very poor at the end of the day. Okay, uh, Patrick, red flags is something you've looked at as well. Yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd try and put this into simple terms because um, there's a danger here that we get into financial language and uh, and, and we, we send our audience to sleep. So if, if it looks like a property company, if it acts like a property company and it sounds like a property company, it probably is a property company and not a care home uh, company. Um, so it, it feels like a, a, a large amount of these large for-profit companies fit into that category, that in effect they're a property business uh, and, and that the elders that inhabit their properties seem secondary to that main priority. Um, uh, obviously, we've been through a period of, of austerity um, uh, since um, credit crunch, etc., uh, and that has meant that the, the only way in which these large for-profits can can be able to maintain returns is by is by cutting costs. Um, that yeah, we, we um, certainly Andy's worked in biz, big business. I've worked in big business. I know you have as well. Um, and that's where people go um, because they've got nowhere else to go for. Um, so um, it, it seems to me like it's as obvious as the nose on your face that to maintain ever-increasing uh, performance for shareholders and owners, um, then th there's only one thing that can suffer, and that uh, is um, the, the care of the elders within, um, within the care homes. Um, I, I think there's also a bigger issue in terms of this, you know, Christine's touched upon it, the unsustainability uh, of this um, of this system, it, it reminds me a little bit uh, when I was working in procurement, where we would continuously extend payment terms to suppliers. Uh, and sometimes we were paying them six months after they delivered the goods, but you have to. It's, it's it's like a drug that you can't come off because that you've got to extend it further each year to be uh, to be um, uh, to be improving. Uh, and at some point, you, 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 your suppliers and other parties turn around and say, enough's enough. We cannot do this. It's just not possible. And things could potentially go bang, um, a bit like the banking crisis. Uh, so I, I guess trying to have this debate now when money is coming uh, uh, in, in the pipeline uh, can only be healthy um, in, in terms of making sure that, A, the system doesn't go bang, uh, and, and secondly that um, the taxpayer, uh, be they private residents or, or funded residents by the council, and the system is being very much pushed towards more private paying residents, um, because that's another way in which you can actually increase fees, um, then um, the, there will be, um, there will be a, a leakage of hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money um, straight to um, straight to owners and and, and shareholders in, in effect 
you might as well kick, cut out the middleman uh, or the middlemen um, from that point of view. Well, the, you've the only... you've mentioned on. taxpayers there. I, I think that's probably a, a useful segue into the next question, really. And we'll ask Andy to take this to start off with. Should the taxpayer uh, pay for residents of private care home groups uh, structured to avoid tax through debt servicing and offshore ownership? I think there's something you've touched on already. Well, look, I mean, I believe in capitalism. I, I you know I believe that there is a there is a a need to have profit making companies in in certain sectors, but not in everyone. It doesn't suit certain things. And care home provision of care, to me, just does not make sense that the taxpayer should be funding. Um, private equity houses and private investors, uh, extremely rich private investors, giving them money to make them richer. It doesn't make sense because let's face it, there's two, you know, there's, there's a very big difference in the primary purpose of a private, privately owned um, profit making organization. And that is its purpose is to make profit. It's there to grow the investment for the shareholders. That's its primary purpose. And sometimes they, they'll do good. So that's, you know, a lot of private companies do good for society and give money back, but their primary purpose is to make profit. The very big difference between that and a not-for-profit organization is a not-for-profit organization, such as a cooperative society or a charity the money goes back to the purpose for which it's set up. I do a lot of work with the co-op, the ones you see on the retail, the retail stores on the corners and the funeral care centers. Their model is fantastic. Every penny you spend in those companies either goes to society or back to the local people, the members, or it gets reinvested in the business. So they buy more property or they reduce the prices of the things they're selling. No money gets leaked. No money goes out anywhere else. Why can't we have something like that in the care home sector? Sean, um, with that point in mind, should the taxpayer uh, pay for the residents of uh, private care homes groups structured in that manner? Um, my first answer is no. It, it, you know, we shouldn't be spending public money merely so that huge profits are made by um, private equity or, or private businesses. Um, and I think the, the whole of this, when it, whenever public money is spent on health or care, uh, there should be some transparency, legislation if necessary, to, and regulation to, to, to force change so that there is transparency at the point of, you know, um, deciding which care home to use. Um, because I do believe, I, I, I appreciate that, uh, it's not always down to the service user uh, as to where they are ha uh, housed, but mu much of the time they can influence where they're going to get their care from if it's going to be paid publicly. But I do believe in people voting with their feet. And, and, and I think if they can make the whole system more transparent around where the money goes, then I think people can make that choice. If, if they know that, uh, that the money that they're they and their family and the local authority or NHS, whoever's going to be footing the bill is going to be going offshore. That may make a difference as to where they actually ask to go to be housed or to be uh, received care. So I do think it's all about transparency and people voting with their feet at the end of the day. Christine. Yeah, I mean, I. I imagine everybody's answer to this in the first instance will be <laughs> no. Um, you know, it, it's it's public money. Um, the idea that it's sort of, you know, <laughs> one, the, the main purpose of the public money should be to serve people living and working in the care homes. Um, and that's not, evidently not the primary purpose of it if it's, you know, being uh, funneled offshore. Um, but I think the key question here is, yeah, one, one how do we facilitate you know, it not going to those sorts of companies. Um, is that just around transparency? Well, we know that improvements in transparency in the US have sort of done a limited amount to actually deter these sorts of um, financial structures. So you've still got like 
I think all five of the biggest care home companies in the US um, are registered in Delaware, which is a tax haven state. Um, so, you know, I think transparency is an important thing, but it's only part of the puzzle. I think we also have to think about more rigid regulations around um, mandating onshore ownership. Um, but the other thing is, um, again, this, this idea that you know, within a kind of market system, we can say people should vote with their feet and that again, that will be sufficient to have an impact on, um, you know, reducing the number of companies that use these financial institutions well, um, these financial techniques. We also know that in the care system, people are really heavily limited in terms of their ability to vote with their feet, both in terms of when they initially choose a care home, because, you know, often that's done um, in a rushed uh, and distressed state. Often they're very limited in terms of needing it to be a local care home. Um, but also once you're in a care home, um, again, come back to what I was saying earlier, that it's um, a very risky business moving an older person uh, from one care home to another. So often they're kind of exposed to poor and declining quality of care without really the ability to easily just kind of switch providers like you would do if you're buying a toothbrush. You know, you say, well, I've bought a toothbrush. This one's rubbish. Um, so I'm going to choose a different brand of toothbrush next time. Um, it doesn't work like that in the care sector. So voting, you know, relying on people voting with their feet is... Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a much more complex and risky strategy, I think. So I think some, basically, um, I feel like we need to take more kind of direct regulatory action in order to prevent these sorts of structures, rather than these kind of, you know, hoping that these strategies will kind of shape the sector differently. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. So is direct regulatory action uh... Uh, the only way forward, Patrick, is there, is there, are there other ways that we can um, take this forward? Yeah, I don't, I don't think th th this should not be just um, stick um, because, yeah, I think as, as Andy pointed out uh, uh, earlier, um, we're not anti-capitalist. Um, we've um, certainly we've done very well out of the capitalist system. Um, but um, for me, I think... Um, just sort of taking the the, the, the tax havens bit, uh, and and Christine's point about buying a toothbrush, uh, it, it might be okay for for Amazon when they're selling consumer goods, um, but we're, we're talking about trying to improve the quality of elders' lives, um, and there needs to be a, a line drawn. So, should there be more regulatory? Um, involvement um and as some people would say it, you know government gerrymandering um it seems that since this sort of rapid expansion of these of these larger uh, for profits has taken place um that um it, it uh, somebody needs to have a conscience Somebody, and if those companies themselves won't take that responsibility, um, it's human nature um, that, you know, um, people will sometimes get greedy if, um, if uh, the checks and balances aren't in place um, to not allow them to do that. It's, it's, it's pure human nature. Um, so, yeah, I, I, would, I would regard it, um, regulation as something that's more, uh, of a conscience. I mean, clearly in England, the CQC is responsible for quality of care and, and care home assessments. Um, but um, to me, those powers should be um, uh, should be extended. They theoretically, I think, look at um, the top um, th those top providers in that sort of um, twenty five to thirty percent of the market. But we're not convinced that they have sufficient expertise to really know what they're looking for. And all they can do is warn that a company is going to go into meltdown probably, I don't know, a month before it actually happens, uh, rather than taking a more proactive view and saying, well, look, you know, this needs to, to evolve slowly so that it doesn't go bang. OK, that's just, this is... a. Uh... Really, really interesting stuff. But now we've talked about uh, legislative changes, uh, and I think it would be would be good to open that debate up a little bit further. I think Andy's got his hand on me. 
I'm sorry, uh, I couldn't see that. Andy. Yeah, I just wanted to add to the, the, the last um, comments, really. Um, voting, voting with our feet, yes, is one key thing. And we should make sure that um, people have the ability to do that and that they can see the right information in order to do that. Um, as Christine said, limited effect in the States, but let's, let's give that choice. The problem is the choice perhaps isn't there. And I think this needs a massive rethink, a radical rethink at government level to say, how are we going to encourage the creation of more not-for-profit and cooperative style um, care home providers? Now, one thing they could do to do that is to provide debt to those um, providers at reasonable interest rates, much in the same way as they fund student loans. All right, so what's stopping the government doing something like that? Be radical, it would be impactful, and would all of the money saved, that difference between the £20 and the £5 that I mentioned in terms of leakage, would then go back into the care home sector. Um, so to me, this is all about radical rethink. It's about trying to come up with a new way of funding and setting up these care home providers. Doesn't mean that we close down all the private ones. That's where we need some regulation, agree with that. We have, um, we have you know, the FSA that provides regulation over financial services companies to protect our money. Well, what about protecting our elderly? What's stopping us having a financial services regulator, or sorry, a care home services regulator that looks at the same kind of things as the, as the financial services side do. Um, make sure that those, those, those companies that do provide private care are robust and won't go bust and actually are providing a minimum level of care. Okay, that's really interesting, really interesting. Uh, thanks, Andy. Look, look, we've, we've been talking about legislative changes uh, or we've been talking about solutions or, or ways to put checks and balances in place. I think we could probably drill into that a, a bit further now. So what kind of legislative changes could we use to address the challenges created by this uh, financial, uh, financial uh, the way we, we structure social care? Um, I'll go around the, the panel and get some ideas of, of, of what those changes could be. But one thing we could we should mention is there's been a lot of talk about England on here, and clearly we, we, we've got to look at the whole of the UK and, and other organisations away from CQC, RQIA, etc. Um, but but what what kind of legislation could perhaps the four um, uh, assemblies and parliaments across the UK take to 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 perhaps change these um, these issues or, or move these issues on, uh, Christine? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously you've got you've got to think about this sort of question in the short versus the the long term, and I think um, you know we are just the short term. First, we've got really to try and rein in some of these financial practices, and and we're doing some um, work as the all party parliamentary group on limits to growth at the moment. Um, around the health and care bill that's going through parliament at the moment and we're trying to sort of sneak in some because it, it's not really an issue that that the health and care bill deals with in in large part but we have tried to kind of get some amendments um or, or kind of advise uh lords and peers on on amendments that they could put into this health and care bill in order to deal with financialization and baroness natalie bennett has put forward um three that we think make a good start so they by no means solve the problem but um three amendments have been proposed the first um is to improve uh, the transparency of the care home sector so basically requiring that um for care home companies they have to meet the same kind of financial reporting standards for their offshore companies even if they're parent companies as they do for their uk based um companies so i hope you know kind of cracking open that black box that is all of these offshore um parent companies in order to first of all, get a grip on where is actually this money going, where's it flowing um, and what's happening to it. The second um, 
set of amendments is asking for a review of the financial regulations within the care home sector, um, you know, kind of with the view to uh, both identifying where there are problematic kind of loopholes and, and gaps, but also looking specifically at the feasibility of legislation requiring um, onshore ownership um, and, and kind of other, other potential um, uh, legislation. Uh, and then the third uh, is actually specifically related to one clause in the health and care bill um, that has kind of slipped underneath the radar. Um, so clause 141 says that the government can provide financial assistance to for profit care companies, which it can't currently do. So if the bill passes, it will be basically allow the Secretary of State to dish out financial support to care home companies that are for profit. Now, very, very sensible idea behind this, which is that, you know, under COVID, we needed financial flexibility to provide support for PPE, etc. However, um, my concern and our, our concern um, with APPG is that um, it could also basically position the government as a financial backstop, which would encourage further financialization because a lot of investors will see, well, you know, even if we over leverage and we take out too much debt and things go wrong, um, you know, it could be viewed as like the kind of extreme circumstances where the government will then step in to bail out that company because now under this new clause, that's a possibility because they're now allowed to dish out financial assistance to for-profit companies. So I think those are some, and, and the amendment that we've asked to be put in place is to basically explicitly um, say that the government needs to ensure that the requests for financial support are not for those purposes. Um, so that's all going through at the moment, that through the House of Lords, and um, I think it you know, will be voted on sometime in the next month or so. But I think those things kind of begin to make a, a start at looking at how we can get our you know, uh, head around this this financial system and how we can start to kind of rein it in. I think in the long term, there's loads more kind of interesting and sort of pie in the sky thinking transformations that would be fantastic um, mm -hmm. to see, which is exactly what Andy's talking about, moving towards more cooperative models of care where workers really get a say in how their care home is run. It's not, you know, run for the purposes of profit, but um yeah, and, well, and, and we'll also, move on to that. I think we'll we'll probably sure. come on okay, to that. Okay, yeah, yeah, fantastic. But, but Patrick, do you want to, to come in on on the, the what kind of legislative changes there could be? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, it is a great start, as Christine said, because I think they've tried to pick the main issues, which is obviously very good. Um, it, um, so, uh, simpler structures would certainly. Um, uh, uh, help because clearly part of not being transparent is to make everything as complex as possible. So uh, I, I bet Vivek had quite a time, but I don't know whether you helped him in terms of finding out all that data and sifting through it all. Goodness gracious me. I, I think it's a fantastic piece of work. Um, so um, f for me, um, the tax haven one is probably the most obvious thing to go for right now because the public has a more of an understanding of it. So I think, I think that's great and should be one of the priorities and should be something that's relatively simple to do. I mean, one of the stats from CHPI is that the, the sort of with tax haven cares pay sort of three times more interest costs than anyone else in the sector. So, you know, it, it's, it's, I think, reasonable to assume that, as, as Andy said, they've only got those tax havens for one, for one reason, and it is to, to hide profits. Um, which means that that profit is not going into um, um, frontline care. Looking further forwards, in terms of Christine said that's um, um, a great start. I, my ethos would be that um, you need to try and gradually evolve the industry so that quality of care becomes the priority rather than profit being the priority um, for all providers. Uh, and a, a note of optimism would say that um, um, you know, nine, 90, I think 96% of, 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 of care providers um, uh, by, by number are small and, and, and medium sized companies. And all of these changes that we're talking about uh, would not really affect a vast proportion. They, they control about 70% um, of the marketplace. So all is not lost in terms of evolving. I think the fear is that if this continual march of big business, which doesn't seem to 
mix with um, the ethos of caring for elders continues uh, it, um, by utilizing a, an unsustainable model, there will be a crash. Uh, and, uh, you know, it doesn't surprise me that the government <laughs> almost, you know, wants to uh, have it down in law that um, that they can bail out um, uh, uh, these these bigger companies, because if that situation actually arose, then in a, in a similar way that the banks were too big to fail, I think care homes would be socially too big to fail. So I think it would happen anyway. Uh, but having it as legislation would probably help in terms of the sting of uh, all these uh, people. There's a there's a fair bit of fat cattery involved amongst these large um, uh, for profits as well. Um, so it does have an awful lot of parallels with what happened um, in the banking sector, possibly not on the same scale in terms of um, um, uh, yeah, affecting world economies. But then it's on a scale where it's affecting people's lives. And let's face it, people are dying unnecessarily as a result of, of um, this particular structure as it, as, it, as it sits now. OK, thank you. And legislative changes. Uh, Andy, you've already touched on this. Yeah, I, I, I go back to what I was saying, really, I think. Um, yes, legislative changes in form of some level of regulation of private providers would go a long way to making a difference. And that might include some of the things that Pat was talking about in terms of limiting the ability to have offshore parents and so on. Um, but I, I go back to what I was saying. I think this just needs a fundamental rethink. I think I don't think this is an ideological issue. No, I think this is something, you know, the where, where we've got now has been growing up over many, 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 many years. Uh, and governments of all colours have been involved in that. It's easy to get private providers in if you want to increase care. It's an easy solution. But what I think needs to happen is people need to step back and think again. We've now got a much increased population of people that are going to need care. Is this fit for purpose? Is there a better way of doing it? Is there a way that we can get maximum value for our money? And I'd add to that, um, you know, I work as a, as a, as a coach in, in business advice, you know, working with people um, to help them to think differently. And one of the key things around motivation is purpose, having a sense of purpose. I, I would put money on the fact that a care home um, worker who is working for a company that is not privately owned, whose sole purpose is to um, provide quality care to its workers, to its, um, its, its, care, its, its care home residents rather, is going to be far more motivated to do a good job and enjoy their job more than somebody who is working for a private company who knows that the purpose of that company is raising, making maximum profit for the owners. So I think it's it's not just about the money, actually. I think this is a, I think you'll just, there is human psychology that would, um, you'd get improvements in, in, in the way that people are motivated to, to do their best in, a, in that kind of environment as well. Um, okay. Well, we so have two hands up on the, on the panel. Um, Sean first, uh, then we'll move back to Christine. Yeah, just a, a, a couple of things struck me. Uh, we'll be talking about the banking and the, the banking crisis or whatever. Um, it, it just strikes me that if we are considering new le legislation going forward, and I hope that all goes well when it, 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 some, some vigorous and testing legislation comes out. But, you know, we heard so much about the stress testing of, of banks back in the day. And I'm just thinking that, you know, if, if a care home, for instance, or a care provider, let's say, meets a criteria of let's say a third of their revenue comes from the public purse they should be succumb or third or 50 percent or whatever it is let's let's set a let's set a level then if they are receiving money from the public purse then they are effectively providing a public service and we want that to be viable stable and sustainable and i think they should be tested to show that that is what that, that is the case so part of this i think for me is um, you know, we want to know that the people who are providing our public services 
are going to be there. They're, 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 they are, you know, sustainable for the future, not just for the, the service that they provide, but for the staff as, as, as well. I think it's important. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, and what, why not incentivize, you know, they're, they're obviously they're, they're, they're putting their, their uh, uh, parent companies in offshore locations, presumably to pay less tax. Could we not set up some sort of incentivization where, you know, uh, company tax is lowered if they meet all of, all of this criteria and they can show that they're viable, they're sustainable. Let, let's reward companies for actually doing what we want them to do. Take a couple of percentages off their company tax that year if they can demonstrate that they, they are viable, sustainable going forward to the future. I think we've got to show it is, you know, I'm not against capitalism at all, and it can work and does work in many cases. But we've got to show that incentivization as well. Okay, I think there's a couple of points that we've been raised, which we can come back to there. But, but just, just, uh, Christine, you had your hand up. Yes, yeah, I'm just going to probably put myself out on a bit of a limb here then uh, in the panel and say, you know, there's been quite a few comments, I think pretty much from everyone apart from me, saying, you know, sort of we're not against capitalism, this is not ideological. Actually, I think it is deeply ideological. I think um, that uh, it's not uh, party political. So I think, um, you know, and you're totally right in saying that, uh, you know, we've had parties of all colours engaging in poor social care policy. That's completely right. However, the, the underlying principles with which they are making decisions about how to run the care sector um, are kind of all, and I won't throw in too much jargon around, you know, neoliberal welfare policies, etc. However, they are based on the idea that outsourcing is good, that, um, you know, profit and competition are a way of driving improvements in quality um, of care. And actually, that's just been shown time and time again through really thorough, detailed research um, to not be the case. You know, uh, competition actually is associated with lower quality care in the UK. And um, we know that, you know, profit is um, kind of uh, uh, in, in UK in the UK care home sector is driving a lot of very negative outcomes because it's um, kind of squeezing that margin. You know, you've got only so much funding to, to deal with from the government. And yes, we need more money into the sector, but given a certain pot, you know, if profit is taking a chunk out, that means less for um, workers, less for residents. So um, I think we really have to, and actually I think cooperative models of care come under, you know, a completely different um, ethos, a different ideology mm -hmm. around, you know, what we should be spending um, the money on and the principles that we need to be using to make decisions and to drive uh, the, the care sector. So I think there's a real need for a, a cross sector conversation about, you know, instead of competition and profit and consumer choice and these very neoliberal ideas about how we should be generating good quality of care, what principles do we need instead, um, uh, you know, to make those sorts of decisions. And, you know, I think it's around collaboration and, you know, cooperative models and um, focusing quality of care rather than profit, et cetera. You know, it, it aligns with what everybody's saying. It's just, I think there's a, a reluctance to name the beast sometimes. And um, I actually, I think, yeah, we, we really need a rethink of our ideology. Around this. Well, we've, had a, we've had an interesting comment here from uh, Jeremy Lehman, who says the case for resocialization of care is overwhelming. Care like, uh, care like health and education is a public good. Political neglect of these public goods uh, carries both the financial cost, the working morale of care home staff and of public attitudes towards care, i.e. risks weakening a civilized and democratic social culture which I think is something we've, we've, that's already been said, I think, there. But um, we, we've sort of, I know Pat's got his hand up. Um, <laughs> I, I can see Pat. But what, there are a couple of points here that uh, we've sort of uh, skirted around a bit, the, the, the notion of perhaps a fit and proper test. Um, uh, Sean, you mentioned um, the other way around, looking at what maybe incentivizing. Is, is there a balance here between those two things, between incentivizing, so should extra tax power made to be awarded based on performance criteria, or as you say, a percentage off tax, or, or should, it, should it be at entry level when you're trying to come into the market with a fit and proper test of some description? Pat, do you want to, do you want to take that? Well, um, 
certainly, it, 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 if if the if the person's name is Putin, then then there probably should be a, a, a fit and proper test. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, I. But strangely, um, let me answer this by just. Uh, uh, continuing the point that um, Christine made about ideology, because I think um, I, I think I do view it slightly differently. I, I think what we're after here is a hybrid solution. Um, because for me, um, uh, the capitalist system can create much more efficiency. That's the plus side, generally, of privatisation. And public can often um, bring complacency because um, you know, money is almost guaranteed uh, and your existence is therefore almost guaranteed. So I mean, this, this is, is about trying to engineer the marketplace so that the incentives, and I think Sean touched on it in terms of if, if money is going to be injected into this system, then try and direct it in such a way that, you are, that your, in, in your performance incentives are all based around quality of care. Change the dynamics of the marketplace so it's not about making money it's about you will get more public funding if you can show that your quality of care um uh, is is improving now clearly that's easy to say and much harder to do in terms of how you measure that and where you put the power and the arbiter uh, of who's doing well from a quality of care point of view etc but i think andy's then quite right that um, the morale of that industry will start to be improved. It's not just about chucking money at it. Um, uh, I, I, and therefore, it, there is the potential for this to become a much more virtuous circle. Could the government, in terms of um, uh, offer cheaper loans to favour a certain type of structure, like a cooperative structure that we've talked about, which is quite radical, but actually um, offer cheap loans? I mean, Sean talked about it in terms of you know, there's reducing um, company tax, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all sorts of ways uh, in which I, I think you could change the, um, the direction of the marketplace itself, which would force those big profits to behave in the right way, but still potentially be uh, successful enough. Uh, because you don't want to destroy the market by talking about radical change. I, I think that's... Um, extraordinarily important. So, going back to fit and proper test, I got there eventually. Um, I think it is more about the ethos, ethos of big business. So, yeah, I have thought about this over the last few days, and I, I think it's probably a, a, a more of a secondary, um, uh, more of a secondary point, uh, and, and, and not of that much great importance because. I've seen how big business works and it, it, it gets to a certain critical mass. It's, it generally isn't about one or two people. It just becomes um, something that, um, uh, that has a life of its own and includes a whole host uh, 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 of people. And, and it's about the culture of the company, not particularly the individual owners um, that, that run them. Okay, Andy, your hands up. Yeah, just building on, on, on Pat's comments. Um, fit and proper yeah of course there should be a fit and proper test you shouldn't be allowed to run a care home group or or, or, or um a care home itself if you're not fit and proper and that, that's just to me just common sense and that should apply whether it's private or public or cooperative or charity um i wanted to build on what what pat was saying however on the um on the different approach to yeah, capitalism and running a profit profit making company versus public, and I, and I do think there's a middle ground. The, the cooperative approach is fantastic in my view because it drives those um, those behaviours around needing to make money because they do need to make money to survive. The money goes around in a circle, right? So they have to have a half an eye on commercials, whilst at the same time half an eye on providing the best possible service to its members and and society so it's a real constant challenge between the two things but it's very different from a um a local authority funded care home where you don't have that dynamic to try and be as efficient as you can to buy to be as commercial as you can so that you can reinvest money in that business, quite a different approach, but I think 
could work really, really well in this sector. I've seen, Christine, if you don't mind me saying, uh, you smile a couple of times when uh, Pat has mentioned we don't want to smash up the system. Uh, uh, I'm wondering whether you want to go out on another limb here. I, I definitely don't want to smash up the system, but I do think that it's very valuable to have one, um, uh, like, uh, you know, have a focus on near term changes that can improve quality of care now for, for residents and improve the lot of workers in the sector, you know, tomorrow, today, yesterday. Um, but I also really, you know, through, through my research, I actually have a, a piece of research coming out in the Lancet Healthy Longevity uh, in the next month or so, exactly on this question of, you know, are markets fit for purpose in, in social care? Um, and I think there is a long term issue here, which is that tinkering around the edges, whilst it will generate some improvements, actually doesn't get to the core of the, the problem. Um, and as I said, we, we know that competition um, actually, you know, in, within the current system drives down quality of care, it doesn't improve it. We know that consumer choice is kind of meaningless in the social care sector because the people living in, in care homes can't easily transfer from one care home to another without suffering significant personal consequences. We know that privatization, you know, basically we know that for-profit companies will do everything they can to make a profit. Um, and we can put in place new regulations. We can, you know, have a, a CQC with more resources and better ability to catch companies that are, you know, doing dodgy financial structures. But the, the kind of fundamental core remains that those companies will try to find a way, they will find loopholes, um, to kind of game the system and they will do it successfully um, because there's lots of very clever people in in those sectors um, who will gain a lot from that and so i i do think that there is a need to start transitioning i don't think we want to smash up the sector because as you said you know it, like that that's a really dangerous game to play however it doesn't work now and it is resulting in disastrous outcomes right now um so you know I, I just I, I feel like we also want to play a long game of looking at building capacity among non-profit providers, whether that's cooperatives or charities um, or, you know, kind of local authority run care homes, whatever it is, just building that capacity and looking at how we can encourage and incentivize shifts in that direction in the long term, because, yeah, I think just tinkering around the edges is not going to bring these big care providers um, in line with what we would aspire to be a really well-functioning care system. And I think alternative ownership structures is something we're going to come on to in a second, but Sean, you've got your hand up uh, about this particular point. Yeah, it, it, when um, Christine was saying, you know, we need to look at it short, medium and long, and what can we do now to improve um, care, improve the quality of care, improve the standards, etc. Um, without sort of going into a shameless plug around what we're doing. I think here at Say So, what we've understood is that um, being a, a, enabling staff to feel comfortable about speaking up about what is going on in the workplace is something that should be grasped at government level because the CQC have some uh, recommendation or sort of guidance that, you know, there should be a whistleblowing policy. But that policy is usually the box is ticked when they have a poster on the wall saying ring your head of head of care or head of HR or with an email address and we know engaging with staff so much that they they know their voice would be recognized or their email address will be known they they can't really anonymously or confidentially report it will they will all be whispered about in the staff room or whatever and so I think there are things that can be done right away and there's an example but there doesn't seem to be an understanding at the right level that actually the staff are there and that the very vast majority of care staff are fantastic. And if only they could be tapped into in terms of, yes, let's hear their concerns, we could improve the workplaces and get, get you know, change the workplaces positively and also keep people safer at the end of the day. So there are things that can be done and then yet there's this lack of understanding sometimes at the at the right levels. I just thought I'd throw that in because when when Christine said, what can we do now? I think that is a perfect example of things that can be done now. Mm, absolutely. OK, that's really useful. Um, 
Before we talk about alternative ownership structures, which I know that uh, Andy has already talked about in terms of cooperatives, I think you made a really interesting point, Andy, on the message board, um, the answer on the comment around the uh, commodification of care services, you, uh, but we can only see that. So could you, do you reckon you can narrate that a bit for us? Uh, hi, yeah, it was in response to uh, a comment that was made um, earlier by one of the attendees um, who was saying that it's a result of a deliberate policy pursued over decades under the ideological umbrella of market efficiencies to slim down the state. And, and I think um, Christine was talking to that, yeah, governments of all sorts of colours have tried to do that to slim down the state and it's an easy, my response was, well, um, it's more, it, it's more about, sorry, the argument was we should stop doing that. Um, my, my, my point is that it's more about thinking differently. Not, it's not about increasing the size of the state. It's about how can we um, provide care homes, maximize the money spent on care and the quality of care. Um, in an environment where we've got an increasing population of people that are going into care, um, whilst not increasing the size of the state, there are other ways of doing it. Okay. By providing the funding in, to enable companies that are set up in a different way, not profit organizations, but set up to with a sole purpose of providing quality care. What's to say, if we did go down the cooperative route, you couldn't make it such that every single person who goes into a care home, a cooperative care home, is a member of that care home provider. It's the same, same structure you have with the retail stores in, in the UK. If you want to become a member, you can have one share, that's it. But that money could get reinvested in property. It's, it's a virtuous circle. So yes, it needs some upfront funding from the government to provide the debt, the loans, or guarantee loans from other places at reasonable rates to get it going. And after, in, in the longer term, it could become a virtuous circle that it funds itself. Okay, so going to, obviously this is a, a useful segue to into alternative ownership structures anyway, but uh, Christine, you, you mentioned that there are uh, lots of, uh, of different models and structures that, that you could look at, uh, cooperatives, th third sector, so on. It, as part of your work, has, has there been um, any uh, further analysis of, of, of routes that can be taken there? I mean, that's actually something that we'll be coming on to, you know, focusing on in the next um, year. You know, it's, it's easy diagnosing the problem, but actually um, offering concrete solutions is something that takes, I think, a lot more um, a lot more work and, and also engagement with a wide variety of um, parties and, and stakeholders. Um, so I'm not going to pin my flag to mast on one particular model right now, but one thing I would say is it, it is it is just phenomenally complex. And this is why I think probably a mix of provider types is a is a good approach. Um, you know, we've even discovered in, in recent months that, you know, companies that appear to be a charity on the surface actually um, engage in the same kind of financial structures as a lot of these for-profit companies where you'll have the operating and the property company split and so the op one operating the services is um, uh, is a charity um, but actually they're paying rent to a kind of related um, company that is owned by a private equity uh, company and you know again funneling money offshore etc so I think um, you know it's it's kind of more complicated than just saying we're going to go you know for a, a charity-led sector or we're going to completely nationalize it because again we know that um, you know that these sorts of national models have their own uh, problems and, and challenges. So I think I think basically taking a spirit of um, experimentation and innovation into the future of, of social care um, and uh, experimentation in terms of the way that services are delivered, the ownership structures, et cetera, um, I think is a, a something we're going to be in a period of flux, I think, as we transition, hopefully, as we you know transition away from these massive providers. Um, but that should, you know, we should see that through a positive lens and, and try and get as much sort of um, monitoring and um, evaluation in there so that we can track and look and see and understand properly which provider types work well for what purposes 
um, and so on. Okay. Well, well, look, I think we're going to move on to the last question now uh, before we, we go into some form of Q&A. But I'm going to change tack a little bit to look at local authorities or government abusing their negotiation powers uh, by forcing fees down to unsustainably low levels. Pat, um, what's your take on that? Right, so uh, for my sins, um, I, I was in the procurement world. Um, so um, I have to say one of, the, one of the things that's very difficult to learn um, as a buyer, particularly if you have a large amount of power in the marketplace, which clearly the, the government does, um, is um, it, it's, it, 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 it's almost um, an antithesis of, of how a buyer is built not to abuse your power <laughs> um, to such an extent um, that you um, that you actually, for very good sort of reasons in terms of the short term and probably how those people are measured, um, to cut costs as much as possible. Um, the problem with that is if you do it over a sustained period of time, then those companies have to find other ways of making um, making profits and keeping shareholders and investors happy which again comes back to the argument in terms of cost cutting um, is it, probably um, where it's most likely that um, the, the same is going to come from to keep that that supposed uh, equilibrium so that there clearly is has to be a reckoning and an understanding from the government that vocationally care workers should be much um, um, more respected within our society, um, uh, be that pay, working conditions, probably most important training, standardised training. We, we've covered it in previous uh, um, roundtables in terms of uh, register, make it feel like a profession, uh, make it something that is vocational because a lot of vocational people go into that sector. That's why they're working because they care, not because of what they're paid. They, they work there be, be, because they care. But to me, the most important thing here is this is a difficult subject because it is all around finance, and you know people will find it a little difficult to follow potentially um, in terms of the great British public. But for me, the plight of elders per se is something that we've all got to work together to lift it up the hierarchy uh, and to me there is an ideal window of opportunity in terms of I, 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 that's a, a poor choice of words because I'm going to say in terms of what happened with COVID um, uh, it's brought some uh, a floodlight onto the sector um, and I think there's a great window of opportunity um, to try and accelerate the rate of change as, as Christine um, a, 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 has alluded to right now that's why we need to try and get together and speak as one voice to try and really raise this in the public psyche. I think you're going to, and clearly, you know, you can you can influence, um, you can try and influence peers and MPs and all the rest of it. But if there's some public pressure coming with that as well, then I think that is would be extremely important. Okay, um, we're we're coming to um, the, sort of the last throws of this session. So if we could try and keep any further points, so that just in case there are any. Q&A questions. Um, in terms of uh, government abuse of uh, the, the, the forcing fees down to low levels, do, does any of the other panelists have any, any points to make about that particular question? Christine. Yeah, just, just that it's, um, it's the, one of the reasons that it's particularly problematic in the care sector is because um, care is by its most fundamental nature about time with residents um and so where you know in other sectors companies can invest in labor saving technologies and and so they can you know kind of uh, invest in technology that means that for example you know each worker can produce more mugs per hour or whatever the output is um in the care sector the more you you know, bring down the, the price that you're willing to pay, the more this company is forced to try and look for ways of cutting costs because they can't um, necessarily improve the labor productivity of their workforce in the way that others, other companies can. And so, you know, what you, you end up happening is you get a, a care workforce that's really crushed under the weight of trying to, you know, um, 
do as much per hour as possible um and you know companies looking for other ways of cutting costs whether that's you know not maintaining the home properly not replacing equipment um food budgets being really tight something that's come up again and again and again with care workers i've spoken to um you know i think just because there's this the companies in the care sector have really limited um room for maneuver uh and uh, and so yeah so this cost minimization is just particularly damaging i think in uh, in in the care sector and obviously needs um you know we need both of those sides to to work we need proper funding coming in to meet the cost of care and we need not that funding to as you say keep being recycled back into uh, care provision and not taken out by profiteers thanks christine thank you very much um, we're going to to bring the sort of formal question and answer side of things uh, to a close um, around the roundtable itself, and we're going to see if there's any um, if there's any questions from the Q and A. Uh, Penny, our facilitator, might point me in the direction of any that that have shown up. I know um, there aren't any at the moment, but if people want to just pop any questions into the Q and A. Um, section just click on the, the button there or um put something in the chat and um we can we can take take from there that's the voice from the gods there thanks Penny, very much. <laughs> now, look, there wasn't there was an earlier question from uh sarah brown who's actually one of the the trustees of hourglass over in northern ireland uh who asks whether there's any evidence that the level of safeguarding referrals or serious serious incidents is higher than the larger profit making organizations does any, anyone have any insights into that? Yeah. Uh, Sean? Um, only that, uh, obviously, uh, as I said in the answer to the question, I have seen, obviously, the general uh, nationwide stats uh, around the Section 42 inquiries and, and, and uh, safeguarding alerts, et cetera, but I've never seen it actually broken down into private and public sector. That would be interesting because if we could make a parallel between... Uh, <coughs> You know where, where more more safeguarding problems arise and lack of funding for instance then that might uh, actually be a, a more powerful argument to put to government to say you need to uh, improve um, funding in some way um, but yes I, i've never seen any stats that actually splits the the safeguarding figures and safeguarding alerts into private or public funding or particular homes actually I know it's something that we as a charity would be really interested in as well, because um, Hourglass take uh, whistleblowing calls uh, and would be very interested to see the whole split between public and private. Um, does anybody else have any more insight on that particular question? No, okay. Well, um, if that's the case, then uh, we only have a couple Ooh. of minutes left. Sorry. We have uh, a question, we've got a question. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm not sure that's a question. That's Lucy Sinekin, sorry. who is uh, our parliamentary officer at Hourglass, who says sorry. it would be also be interested to compare if more or fewer safeguarding alerts turn into a Section 42 inquiry from care home versus own home. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, that's another really interesting point. Uh, care home versus own home. Uh, again, something from an something from an Hourglass perspective, which would be really interesting. Uh, but look, um, I really wanted to uh, to thank everybody for uh, being part of the panel uh, or being part of the audience today. Um, I think there's been some absolutely fantastic points raised, um, some slightly worrying ones too, in terms of uh, the financial structures of these organisations uh, and the legislative changes that are required. Um, and I, I think um, the, the cooperative point that's been raised a few times by Andy. In, in fact, actually, as we're coming to a close, um, Andrea Nicholson-Jones has, has pointed out that it would be interested to explore if cooperative movement could be used to support people in their own homes as well, um, as in care homes. So there's some continual, this debate continues on. Um, so the, um, the ARC coalition um, was formally launched this week. Um, there'll be plenty more information around that um, on the, the members' websites. Uh, the members, as I pointed out earlier, are the hosts of today's uh, session, Veteran Care Home Systems, BCHS, um, or Hourglass, um, the Nightingale's Army and Say So. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there will be, we will also look at doing further regular webinars on a range of issues too. Uh, but 
Uh, I'd like to thank absolutely everyone for their, their time and for their uh, candor on this. And I look forward to, to um, hearing whatever subject we get to discuss next. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you. We'll close the session now. Thank you very much.